Revelation chapter 11, we're going to start at verse 1, we're going to read down to verse 12. If you do not have your Bible, it will be on the what, Tricia? All right, okay. Verse 1, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles. Now in the Bible, Gentiles just represents anybody that's not a Jew, which Jews are God's chosen people in the Bible. And so a Gentile is anybody outside of that. I am a Gentile. You are a Gentile. We are Gentiles who come into faith through Jesus by what Jesus did. So that's what a Gentile is. So basically, the outside of the worship place, the outside of the temple has been given to the worldly folks. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's three and a half years. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Um, Let me pause again. Sackcloth was in the Bible something that when there was a great tragedy, when something happened, they would take off their outer garments, they would take off their good stuff, and they would put on what would be like bags, like rags, and they would go into the temple, and they would pray and fast for for what was going on. And so these two witnesses have seen what's going on in the world, and they've seen what's happening, and they're so heartbroken about what's happening that they've gone into this temple, and they're praying in the street. They're praying for what they see in society. They're praying for the world that they have been sent to. They're praying and, and fasting for what's happening around them. And, and so that's kind of where they're at now. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God on the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. That seems harsh. These have power to shut heaven so no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as the desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also, where also our Lord was crucified." Then those from the, uh, from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. I promise it's not going to be that scary when we get moving, okay? It does sound very, it's very uplifting, this Bible story. Mm-hmm. Verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and a great fear fell on all those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Now, I want to take those passages, and we're going to flip through some stuff, and I want to talk about the the subject of the warning. The warning. That's what we're going to talk about. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask that you would be in this place. God, that you would speak through me, that we would understand your word a little more clearly, a little more deeply. And God, that that you would just continue to minister and continue to bless each and every time we meet together. In Jesus' name, amen. So the question was, who are the two witnesses in the book of Revelation and what do they do? Well, very simply, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation are sent messengers from God to declare a warning to people. Now, We'll look at what they do, we'll look at what they are, and then we're going to equate that to what our life is and what our life should be. And and so what I want to tell you now is you have to look at the witness and you have to live like the witness. So looking like the witness, looking at the witness is easy. He's an example. Their purpose and their presence was to be an example to a dying world. A world that every day falls farther away from God. And I know you might not think that that's the world that we live in today, but if we watch the news and we understand that what God created this world to be and what we're living in, it's a very different scenario. We are living in a falling, fallen, broken, broken, I can't talk, world. 
But if we're if we're got our eyes closed to the gospel message and we don't understand what that means, then we just think it's another day as usual. It's another society. There's been riots. There's been all this stuff going on. And it's just it's been happening since 80s, 70s. It's been it's all been going on for so long. It's just another day. But it's not just another day. Things get progressively worse the more that we walk away from what God has created this earth to be. So their presence was to be an example to a dying world, an example of living for God when you're surrounded by a godless generation. People don't want to hear a message of holiness anymore. They want to hear a message of God understands and we can live however we want and God's cool with it because he's a loving God. He doesn't have problems if we want to go out and do whatever we want to do. It's not accurate. But yet so many people go to so many churches that are filled and packed and the walls have to be knocked down and they have to go buy bigger buildings and stadiums because people can come to church and do whatever they want and live however they want. And the pastor looks at them and tells them this nice, fluffy, uh, uh, sugar-coated message about God is love. And that's true. God is love. And, and, but God is not love to the point of overlooking everything that we fall in. God is love to the point of when we fall, he's there to pick us up. He's there to walk with us and to wrap us in his security and his strength and his presence. That is what God is meant to be to our lives. An example. You may be saying to yourself, okay, I get it. I get how I can look to them as an example, but I can't live like them because they have these special powers from God. And, and I'm just me. I'm just an ordinary person. And this is what makes the witness more ex, um, or, uh, effective. When the ordinary people do extraordinary work, when regular people go out and do the things that God has called us to do, the way I read my Bible, Jesus empowered ordinary people to do extraordinary work in the world. You see, in Luke 9, he, he calls the disciples to him. And anybody, even today, who would follow Christ, who would say, I am a Christian, the name Christian is, is based off the name Christ. And Christ was not Jesus' last name. Christ was his title. He was the anointed one. He was God in the flesh. Christ was the one who could take away all sin from the world, and he could walk where he wanted, and he could do what he wanted because because he was fully God, but fully man. It was not his last name, it was his title. And if we are Christians, we are saying we are connected to the Christ. So the same power that was in him can flow through me in the same way that Jesus healed, I can heal. And the same way that Jesus preached, I could preach. And the same way that Jesus called Lazarus from the dead, I can call somebody from the dead. But maybe you've never seen it. So you don't think it's possible. If you've been here long enough, you've heard. I have. I've seen it. I've been there. I've told you the stories. And so that's that is what it is. But there is a real power of God that is waiting for us to wake up and reach out to it. There is a real power of God that acts as a warning in our life. And Jesus in Luke nine calls the disciples over. He's like, come here, fellas. Let me holler at you the Jonathan translation. He told the disciples, I'm going to give you authority over every evil spirit, every disease, every death, and all manner of life. Jesus empowered the ordinary to be extra, extraordinary, extra powerful, extra faithful, extra necessary. We are a necessary Thing for a dying world. People want to see that there is a real God who wants to do real things in their real lives. But we sit in church quietly and we don't tell them. And we go to school and we go to work and we go to the supermarket and we see the people struggle and we see the hurt and we see the pain and we're plugged into a power source of Jesus and we don't go and say to them, I know what you need. I know something just like, hey, will you go to church with me? I know you won't know nobody. I know it might be weird, but just go out. You can sit with me. Just go out. I'll introduce you to people because your life is falling apart and maybe it won't get better. I'm not going to sit here and paint this picture that everything's going to look like a nice Hawaiian sunset on a clear day. That's not what I'm saying. Maybe things don't get better, but look around. 
There are people in this room that when you need something and you need to be lifted up, you call on Amish Pastor Josh and you say, hey, Brother Amish, can you come over and help me out? And he's right there to get in his buggy and to come over to your house (laughs) and help you out. It may not get fixed, but you're not alone. You're not by yourself. You have somebody to walk with, talk with, most importantly, pray with. But it has to be something that we live in. Look at John and Peter in Acts chapter 3. There was a man who was lame from birth, laying at the temple and begging for money. He thought that what he could get from people would be his way out. And Peter and John came by. And he'd seen these guys. He's like, oh, they got, they, you know, they're local celebrities. I know they got some change. Hey, yo, Peter, can I get a dollar? I need to get me a couple Debbie snacks from the marathon up the street. Can I get a dollar? And Peter was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Peter and John walk over to him and they say, all right, listen. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And after so many years of being broken and so many years of being beat down and so many years of being depressed and so many years of being dependent on somebody else, finally somebody came to him with life inside of them and said, you don't have to be dead no more. You don't have to be broke no more. In the name of Jesus, stand on your feet and start walking. Take a step. Take a step. Whatever you do, just get up and start Walking. Now, this message serves as a warning. Now, let me ask you this. How many people enjoy warnings? None. Okay. Normal people see a warning, and they might not enjoy it, but they see a a warning as something geared to help them. This warning is to help you stay healthy. It's to help you stay alive. To help you not fall off the bridge. When we moved from Florida to Indiana the very first time, there were signs on the bridges that said, be careful, the bridge ices first. And I was like, well, avoid bridges. It's the best thing to do. Because in Florida, nothing ices, except your refrigerator or your air conditioner if it gets too hot. Never mind. To make sure that we're not going the wrong way or into a dangerous situation, there's warnings. For some Warnings are overlooked. They're just people trying to be too careful. I mean, they say, because, like, listen, let me give you my experience. Hurricanes, been through enough of them, I know the drill. Evacuate, you're going to die. You're probably not going to die. We got to go. Probably not, don't have to go. All right, the storm's over. Stay in the house, because there's a wire down right outside your door, and if you walk outside, you will die. Not going to happen. In fact, when the, when the law enforcement and the authorities come on the radio and say, stay in the house, that is your cue as a native to Florida to leave the house and assess the damage, to understand what's going on. That, so what we do right away is we promptly ignore the warnings. That's the way I like to roll. I like to ignore rollings. There's the rest of us. We don't like warnings at all. We don't think they're useful. We don't think they're important. In fact, they're a little disrespectful. Dis- disrespectful? disrespectful with their condescending tone. Don't walk here. Don't you tell me how to live my life. Don't swim here. I will do what I want. In fact, we used to swim in canals and stuff all over the, ta- all over the place we lived, and, and we would jump off the bridge. There'd be cars driving by, and we'd jump off the bridge because I was an idiot kid. I don't think I could even bring myself to do that now, but <laughs> we would jump off the bridge and go swim into the side of the canal. When I say canal, I don't mean nice little Indiana pond. I mean a literally, like not even maybe as wide as this room, canal with algae and, and seaweed and nasty stuff all in it, and we're swimming over, and then we look over. Oh, there's an alligator. I guess we need to go down the canal a little bit to a different bridge and then when the alligator moves closer we just keep moving like we don't we don't pay attention to warnings and then there was a couple years ago when we were in Orlando a few years ago there was a family that came for vacation and and there are signs everywhere on the especially on the Disney properties there are signs everywhere and it says no swimming no swimming but it doesn't tell you no swimming because there's alligators and they will kill you just no swimming We don't want you swimming in our Disney pond. 
and somebody went down there and was swimming at a beach that they were allowed to swim at. But you have to assume in Florida that every body of water has something that's ready to kill you. So they were swimming, and there was no signs. And the little kid got grabbed by an alligator, and he died. Very heartwarming story for you this morning, isn't it? I can see you're all very plugged in. Warnings are meant to help us, but so often we ignore the warnings. And I'm guilty. I'm right there with you. We're walking down together. We're ignoring the warnings. But what about the warnings that are not there? What about the warnings that you can't see? What about the warnings that you didn't know you were missing until someone pointed them out to you? And that is what we are to be, somebody who points out warnings. Like when I see a do not enter sign, I don't see it as, a, as, as something I should do. I see it as a challenge. And I'm like, challenge accepted. And I'm walking up in that piece. A sign on the road, a, block, a, a person blocking traffic. When I see them little dudes with the signs that are like turning and saying slow, I'm like, how dare you? I will go past you. I don't even speed. But because you have a sign that says slow, I'm going to go past you at Mach 3 speed and knock your hard hat off your head. Don't you tell me how to live my life. I have problems. I know you guys are. This is my therapy session with y'all. Y'all are helping me out, working through my problems there, okay? Man, y'all are just really staring at me right now. I guess that's kind of the point. Chastity is also not great with warnings. Where's Kim? Is Kim here? Okay, I get to speak freely today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kim's always like, leave her alone. Chastity's not good with warnings. If you think I'm lying about that, just get in the car with her and drive down the block, and you will immediately think that you're on a roller coaster and you're about to die. Now, I said that just because when I was coming back from a men's conference with Jeremy and Mr. Ely and, and Josh, and apparently, I'm I, like, listen, I don't make any false claims. I'm a terrible driver. I know that. I hate to drive. I don't like it. I don't want to. I figure if I wreck the car, I don't have to drive it. So I don't like driving. But I had to drive, and so I'm driving, and, and I felt like I was doing pretty good, maintaining the speed and doing what I needed to do. But apparently, Mr. Ely back there was about to die, and Jeremy was like, can you tone it down? He's, he, you're tripping over here. And I'm like, well, okay, I don't, I don't, I'm a bad driver. I know that. But Chast I know I'm a bad driver, and I own it. Chastity thinks she's the world's greatest driver. Just drive with her. Just, just drive with her. Just drive with her, and you be the judge. See, she sees those speed limit signs that are warnings and uses them like they're suggestions, like there's a question mark at the end. <laughs> speed limit, 25? I mean, whatever you feel comfortable with. You still got control of the car. You're good. You know, deer crossings are signs that you see a lot. They're warning you here to make sure that you don't hit a deer because apparently that's bad. I've actually hit a deer in a work truck, and I've realized that it does damage. Uh, in Florida, we have panther crossing signs, but um, they cross so fast you don't even see them. So it's more like panther warning, don't go in the woods signs. But again, that's just Florida. So one time we was at a park. I'm getting to the sermon, I promise. This is my intro. I'm building the foundation for y'all because I care. Um, one time we was at this park we used to go to all the time by the house called Veterans Park, and Tim was there. And uh, I don't know if he was trying to impress people or what he was trying to do, but there was this canoe, this little, like, paddle boat. Oh, she's, 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 you already missed it. I already said what I had to say about chastity, so we're good. Um, and, and, and Tim got into this canoe, and, and there, there's a big alligator in this pond at the park, and we used to go over there and says, don't feed the alligator. We used to throw it fish and bacon and whatever else we had, Twinkies. And, and so <laughs> it, it wasn't afraid of people at all. And so Tim got in this boat and started just paddling his way out to the middle of the, I mean, the thing couldn't have been no bigger than this tank right here, and he's paddling his way out to the middle of this pond. And it's a, it's a decent-sized pond. It's not huge. And then all of a sudden, Tim realizes that boat has a hole in it. So what does he try to do? He tries to take his socks off and stuff them in the hole. He tries to do whatever he can do to try to take his way back, and eventually the alligator is sitting right where he always sat on the other side of the pond, and Tim's like, well, if I can see him, then he's good. So Tim's trying to paddle back. The boat is taking on serious water. I don't know if he realized that all of a sudden he's like uh forget this 
jumped out of the boat because the boat was too sunk, and then he started to swim. When Tim got in the water and started to swim, the alligator was like, time for a dip. He got in the water too. <laughs> Tim is like, boom, got to go. He's rolling. He's trying to swim, out swim this water. You don't know where the alligator is because the water in Florida is like black, and you can't see in it. You put your arm in it, and you lose your arm. And So Tim's trying to pedal. And, pedal. He's pedaling. He's pedaling. And he's trying to swim out of this water, and he gets out of the water, and he made it because he's sitting here. So praise the Lord for that. But... There was signs, like the alligator sitting there. We just ignored them. That is what we do in society. We're living in a society that loves to ignore or disobey warnings. Society says Christians are weak. Society says Christians are fools. Society says that's too many rules to follow. Society says it doesn't take all that. But there is a real purpose to following God. I don't have this Bible just because I think it looks good when I come up front. I don't have to bring this Bible up here. I don't have to bring this Bible to church. How many people use their Bible on a phone or a tablet or a smartphone or a screen on the thing. Most people do. I use this Bible because it is something personal to me. I write in it. I highlight in it. I take notes in it. When I'm listening at another person preach, I'm writing notes in my Bible. Whatever I got to do to get me closer to God, because this is the way that we find peace with God. This is the way that we find direction through life. This is the warning that God gives us. But so many people, especially church people that should know, that should know that we don't just let this sit at home. They, 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 if they bring their Bible to church, they might open it for the reading, close it, set it next to them on the thing, and then sit there and do whatever they got to do. But then they go home, and we set it on our tables, and we close it, and we walk away from it, and we forget we even have it. There is a point to having that Bible. There is a point to having God's Word at your fingertips because God wants you to be able to get in there and see the warning. You can't just live any old kind of life and let God say, oh, it's okay, just come on in and still be accepted. God, it's not about rules. It's about when you ask God to change your heart, to match His heart, then God will start to make the things that, that you found difficult about serving God easier because now your heart is lined up with His heart. And now you're moving in the same direction. They see people living in their standards. They see people living different. They see people whose lives have been changed by the power of God, but ignore the warnings of the Bible. And it makes me think that the world is falling farther and farther from a God who wants to move closer and closer. God is crying out to us as a society. He's crying out to us as a people. Don't just go to church. Don't just sit in the chair. Be active in the gospel. Be active for Jesus. Tell somebody something. Go to Starbucks and buy the person behind you some coffee and tell the lady in the window or the dude in the window just to write, God loves you or something. I don't know what it all looks like for each person, but our job is to be a light in a dark world. And the world is getting darker and it's dimming the light. Instead of the light getting brighter and shining into the darkness. Several years ago, there was, a, there was a massive wreck on a railroad track. A train was loaded with young people who was coming from school. And a train, uh, there was another train on front of them. The, trains, the one train with all the kids on it from school stalled out on the railroad tracks. So they sent the people to go down the track with the flags and to wave the flags to let them know that there was a stopped train on the track. Well, the other uh, train that was supposed to come through eventually came through, and he seen the flagger, and he slowed the train down, and he kept going. And thinking that everything was okay, the students on the train that was stopped were talking and laughing and giggling and having a great time. And all of a sudden, that train that was coming in seen the stalled train and tried to stop but couldn't and it hit that train and they both derailed and almost everybody on both trains died but before the train hit the other train the conductor jumped out and saved himself they found out and they called him into court when they were doing their investigation and they said did you not see the flagger he said yeah i seen the flagger he was waving an orange flag so i laid i, I slowed down Red means stop, orange means slow down. He said, did you not see the warning? He said, yes. 
Then they called the flagman in and he said, what color flag were you waving? He said, I was waving the red flag. And the judge said, are you sure? And he said, absolutely, no question, red flag. Both insisted they were correct in their testimony, so the judge ordered the flag itself to be brought into the courtroom. And to the surprise of the judge and everyone, they were both correct. The flag was red, but it had been used and been in the weather so long that it had become faded and dirty, like a yellowish, orangish color. And that is the way that society sees Christianity. Too many churches are waving dirty yellow gospels. They're waving gospels that show a different Jesus. We're waving gospels that don't reflect the true hope and peace of Jesus. They don't need yellow no more. They need a red gospel. They need a gospel that is full of passion, that is full of fire. They need a gospel that is the color of the blood of Jesus that dripped down a cross to pay for you and to pay for me. That is the gospel. We need to be on fire for Jesus again. And the world has has gotten a diluted gospel long enough. We need a strong church and a strong gospel. The Bible serves as many things. It serves as encouragement. We love it when it's encouraging. Thank you, God, for that encouraging word. I couldn't have got through this season in my life without that encouragement. The the, the Bible is peace when we need it. When we're going through a hard time, when we've lost someone, when we're dealing with something, it's comfort when we want it. And we're okay with the Bible as long as the Bible is okay with us. The minute we have to change something, then the Bible is judgmental. Then the Bible is outdated and overrated. The minute that the Bible goes against what we think it should be, then the the Bible becomes wrong. But we can sit in churches and we can fill churches for funerals and we can see loved ones die and we can hear the scripture and we can hear the passage and we can go home the same way because the dead person sitting in the room is not enough of a warning to say that there is something better for you. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I don't know what that's like because I've been that person in the funeral. As a teenager, I've seen my friends die. I've, seen, I've been at the funerals. I've seen that, and it never made me change anything because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Boy, it was cold out there, but it is not cold in here. Sweet Lord Almighty. Whew. Hold this. Don't tell me how to live my life. That's when the Bible serves as something people don't like. It serves as a roadmap or a warning. You know, people like to say, and maybe you're one of those guys in this room. If you're one of those guys in this room, holler at me. Do you, do you stop and ask for directions, or are you one of them guys that's like, I ain't asking, we're not lost? Who's the, who's the we're not lost guy? Okay, there's a couple of those. Who's the guy that will throw everything out the window and be like, we're lost, we need help? That's me. That's me. And then a bunch of you are just liars because you didn't raise your hand. So, um, so <laughs> I've seen you. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Okay. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the get lost and have to stop and ask for directions, people. And I'll never forget, I stopped and asked directions trying to get to Chastity's parents' house in Kentucky, and, and I couldn't know how to get there. And, and we, easy. <laughs> Every road looks the same in Kentucky. There's a hill and there's grass and there's a cow. And then there's another hill and some grass and a cow. And there's another hill and some grass and some cows. He's like, mm, sing that song. Um, can, my, can my Kentucky folks give me an amen? Um, this lady, I asked this lady at the gas station because I was lost. There's no need to delay it. I hate driving. The quicker I find out where I'm going, the quicker I get out of the car. Can you tell me how to get over here? Oh, honey, you're right around the corner. Okay. You go on down to where old man Johnson's farm burned down a couple years ago. Lady, I'm lost. That means I don't know the area. Oh, right, right, right. Well, you know where that, you know where that Walmart used to be before they moved it across? No. I need you to give me stuff that's still there. I can't get where I'm trying to get on yesterday's directions. 
And so many times we try to get where God's bringing us on yesterday's direction, on yesterday's word, on yesterday's encouragement, on yesterday's church. It ain't yesterday's church. It ain't yesterday's word. This word stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. We have started changing God instead of letting letting God change us. There has to be a shift in our thinking so that when the warning signs pop up, we understand exactly what we're doing. And now God... God has sent witnesses in the middle of a revelation. The revelation is the end times. If you're not familiar with the Bible, the, re- the, re- the, 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 the rewind, the revelation can be scary if you let it. It can push you away if you let it. When I first started reading this Bible and I got into revelation, I was like, well, I don't see the point, Dan. <laughs> Let's just call it a day. Let's just sell everything and be homeless because I don't see the point. And then you read more of it and you read more of it and you read that there are things that have to happen before God's full purpose can come into fruition in in, in life and in this world. And that is what the revelation teaches you. It teaches you there's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of things that are uh, like there's seven lampstands. The seven lampstands are seven churches that Jesus is writing to in the beginning of the book. There's stars. There's, there's all these different things. And when you get in and study it, it's all things that are symbols. It's symbolisms that, that John is seeing in, in a vision as he's on Patmos and he's stranded. Now, the word he was on the island of Patmos. Patmos is a word that means my killing in Greek. He was stranded and being tormented by solitude. And God comes to him all of a sudden and says, I want to show you something. And the Bible says that he was taken in by the spirit and he started beginning beginning to see the things that God was showing him. Revelation literally means God is showing you something. It's something that you can't get. And I'm going to give you the words. Revelation comes from the Latin word revelatio. The Greek word apocalypsis and the English word apocalypse, that's what revelation means. It's showing the end of a godless society when God comes back to do what he needs to do. And it can be very scary if you're on the wrong side of it. But if you know who Jesus is and you know who he is in your life and you live a life that Jesus is honored by, then revelation is not scary. It's actually something to look forward to. Now, I'm going to give you real quickly a few thoughts. There are pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation beliefs. Tribulation is a lot of what, you know, when it was saying that they're three and a half years, three and a half years, all that stuff. Tribulation is a seven-year period. Now, I'm going to try to give you some theological, doctrinal belief stuff real quickly so that I don't take up too much time with it. The three and a half years equal a seven-year period of tribulation. Now, I personally believe that those on this earth as Christians, those of us who serve God, there is going to be a rapture. Second Thessalonians talks about it. There is going to be a rapture, okay? The rapture is when God comes through and he cracks the sky and he calls all of his children that are on this earth to come up to be with him and we arise and we meet God in the air and those who remain are the people who are away from God. That's the rapture. Now, there are people that think that the rapture happens before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, which is a bad time, or in the end of the tribulation, which means you've gone through all this revelation stuff, and then Jesus brings you back. But I personally, based on things that I read, and it's not like a life-changing, you're right or you're wrong doctrine, but I personally believe that it's a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't believe that God leaves people here to suffer through things that we are not meant to suffer through. I believe that we will be caught up in, 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 into the heaven with God and that those people who are left will have an opportunity to receive the gospel and to receive salvation, and then at the end of it all, it's over. Now, I know that's a lot, and, and if you really get into it and you study it, it's not as, as, as difficult and, and as I'm probably making it out to be. But there's a couple things that I want to show. The word witness right here. This word witness, these two witnesses, is the Greek word martis, 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 M-A-R-T-Y-S. It's where we get the word martyr. The word martyr is synonymous with somebody who has died for their faith. 
somebody who's gone overseas as a missionary, somebody who, who like, like the, um, the, the, uh, a few years ago when the ISIS terrorists were, I don't know if I'm allowed to say terrorists, but I just did because I'm not politically correct, so just deal with it. Um, but the ISIS terrorists were lining up all these Christian guys on the beach, and they were beheading them, and they were lighting them on fire inside of cages, and they were drowning them, and they were doing all this. Those people were identified as martyrs for the gospel. They died for their faith. Now, the difference is a martyr does not mean somebody who died for their faith. The word martis is actually a word that means witness. But in the days of, the, of when the Bible was being written, most people who witnessed for Jesus died because of their faith. The apostles died. The disciples, they all died. They were boiled in oil. They were crucified upside down. They were stoned. They were beaten. All of them paid the price for their faith. And they became martyrs. But they died because they were a witness. The word martis means witness. Witness is what people need to be. Now, in the book of Revelation, a warning. Two witnesses speak to people that they don't really even care about. That they, I mean, the witnesses care, but the people don't care what they have to say. People who don't care. These two witnesses resemble what God has called each and every one of us to be in their own way. I'm going to give you my few thoughts and we're going to shut it down. This is my first closing, which if you've been here more than once, you know means nothing. So just keep with me. I'll close a few more times, and then we'll get done. <laughs> I want to give you a few points that we're going to discuss, and we're going to shut it down. By a few, I mean five, but they're short-ish. <laughs> Those are the people that have been here a time or two. Okay. The first one is the problem. These men were a problem. There is a problem. It says, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it. He is telling them to measure all this stuff. Measure the house of God. Measure the worshipers. Measure everything. But leave out the court. The court was supposed to be a part of the temple. But what he's showing us is that there are people who are outside of the relationship with God who are getting so far inside the temple that they're changing the doctrine of what Jesus is meant to be. Amen. Don't measure the people who are wrong. They're technically in the church, but they're outside of faith. Yeah. Don't measure everybody because everybody who says the name of Jesus is not really a Christian. Everybody who labels their building a church is not really worshiping. Everybody who calls themselves a lover of God is not really sincere. Don't measure everybody. They have chosen to stay away from him. And people all the time, over and over again, have asked me this question. If God is real and God is loving, how could he send a person to what is described as hell in the Bible? It's very simple. If you've asked that question, I'm going to give you an answer. Hell was created for a fallen angel. It was created as an eternal punishment for an eternal being. We as humanity were made to be eternal beings. We were created in God's image, but our life was limited the moment Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. Death is supernatural to us. It is not our natural state. But because sin entered in, death entered in, how could God send somebody there? God is not sending anybody there. We make the choice, and God honors it. You want to go that way? Go that way. One of the biggest problems in the world is people overlook the problem. There are people being left out, left out of love, left out of mercy, left out of grace because people have decided that they should be left out. We are guilty of making limitless judgments on a limited understanding. In other words, we're making eternal judgments on somebody based on our temporal understanding. And people say, well, you can't have them come to church. They, they're, they're drug addicted. You can't have them come to church. They're gay. You can't have them come to church. They, they live together and they're not married. They got kids. They're doing all this stuff. They, they ain't married. You sh you, they shouldn't even be at church. Why can't we love people? 
I know, I know, it's, it's, it's tough. But people think that, 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 that God is against them if they live different. God is not against anybody. Let me give you a couple passages of Scripture that back this up. God's will, according to 2 Peter 3, 9, is that none perish but all come to repentance. Everyone come to repentance. Why do you wait before the rapture? Why do you wait before the tribulation? Because according to 2 Peter, God's will is that none perish but everyone comes to repentance. Let me give you another one from the Old Testament. I'm going to give you both sides. In case you're one of them people that's like one testament is relevant, one testament isn't, I'm going to show you how they back each other up. Moses, who wrote the first five books of the the Bible. Moses, who was given the Ten Commandments. The, the, The law, the Ten Commandments is actually referred to as the Mosaic Law because Moses got it. Let me explain to you what Moses said in Exodus chapter 34. He said, the Lord is merciful and gracious, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. And people get a hold of that verse and they're like, yeah, yeah. I've seen churches that are, and I'm not trying to get into no political debate with you. And if you want to do that, then I'm the wrong customer. Just put your opinion on a piece of paper and put it in the suggestion box right out front. It's a trash can. Put it in there. And, um, and, uh, but but this, is what, this is what they say. Well, God's okay with anything because he's merciful and he's loving and he's keeping grace for thousands. He's okay. He, I could do what I want. I could live how I want. And they cut the verse there. Let me continue with the rest of the verse. You ready? Keeping mercy for thousands. By no means clearing the guilty. He is merciful that while we are away from him, from him, he allows us to have the opportunity to come to him and to get down and to say, I'm so sorry. I've lived my life for me. I need it to be different. I, I, the only way I know how to do it is to give it to you. Will you take my life? That is what it means. The second thing that we get out of these passages is the proclamation. Verse three and four. He gives his witnesses powers. And it says that they prophesied for three and a half years. A lot of people in churches today, they hear the word prophecy and they think the snakes are coming out. You know what prophecy means? To speak for God. In the days of the prophets, they went to the prophets when they wanted to know what God thought about the situation. Prophecy is not something that is evil. It's not something that's, that's, that's devil worshiping. Prophecy is speaking on behalf of God. When God gives you the word, you speak to the people. What I do is I spend my week and I, throughout my time and I study and I get into my Bible and I pray and I ask God to speak to me so I can come in fresh on Sunday and speak to the people. This is my form of prophecy to God's people. Why can't we still proclaim biblical truth and not be offensive? He said that he will give power to witnesses to prophesy. To prophesy is to, be, is to declare God's word, but we don't want to offend people. I've had people in this church that lived, this church and in other churches I've been in, that have been in every kind of lifestyle that you can imagine. And then they come up to me and we talk. I say, if you fall asleep on me again, I will throw you in this water. We will, we will, we will they, they would talk. They would do, they, they, why, why can't we love people? We can love people with a godly heart and a godly love and still not be like, God, God understands. There can't, they, it can't be just either God understands or you're out of the picture. We have to go to people and show them, yes, God understands that we are bound. God understands that we're in a world that is not our own. God understands that we struggle, but God is waiting to pull us out of that. He's got his hand stretched out so that if we would come to him, he would pull us out. The proclamation, people do not want to hear the proclamation. I, Jonathan, am unqualified to do what I do. I cannot preach the first word. There's people that like the way I preach. There's people that hate the way I preach. There's people that say I yell too much, sweat too much, too fat, too, I don't care, too bald. My head's too shiny. I don't care. My beard is orange. Shut up. (laughs) You're Amish. (laughs) 
but people need a messenger. And the messengers are sitting silent. There is a messenger inside of you right now waiting to tell somebody the message. Well, I can't. I'm not perfect. I don't know the Bible. I don't know. I don't. You don't need to. You know what you need to know how to say? Jesus loves you. Can you tell me more? Nope. That's all I got right now. But I'll study some more and I'll come back and I'll give you something more later. But right now, that's all I got. And then later, Jesus died for you. Oh, that's different than the last message. How's that work? Not really sure yet, but I know it happened. So I'm going to come to you and I'm going to give it to you later. You don't have to be super theological and smart. You know how many times I've preached sermons and I've had people in the, in, in the congregation that have had doctorate degrees in the, in the Bible and in Greek and Hebrew and they knew the Bible upside down and backwards and, and all this stuff and I would be so intimidated and all of a sudden God just said to me one day, he's like, don't worry about them, you're here for me. You're here for me. People don't have to like the way you talk. People don't have to like the way you dress. People don't like to have... But they, that's how God talks to me. It might not be how he talks to you. You might just not be on that level yet with him. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, um, the third, Lord Jesus, bless his heart. Um, the third thing, <laughs> oh, if you're new to this church today and that today is your first next level experience, I'd like to tell you that this is not normal, but it absolutely is. The power is the fourth thing. The power, the power, the power. Verse six. They have power to shut heaven so no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them into blood. Now, there's a lot of, uh, who are these witnesses? Some think Moses and Elijah. Some think Elijah and, um, and uh, uh, the other cat that didn't die. What's his name? What's his name, Mackenzie? Enoch. There you go. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, because neither one of them two died. And so it doesn't matter. What matters is that these people will have power to do what God needs them to do, just like in Exodus, just like with Elijah. When Elijah called fire from heaven, when Moses turned water to blood, they didn't do it in their own authority. They did it under God's authority. And these witnesses will be sent with the power of God. I want to see the power of God make a comeback in the church. The power of prayer, the power to heal disease, the power to break bondages, the power to set captives free. We need the power of God back in this world. Another mass shooting this weekend, another tragedy, another death, and we want to make it a political issue, and it's not a political issue, it's a biblical issue. How do you fix it? Well, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and will seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and then I will have mercy on their land. It didn't say if you elect the right president, if you elect the right Congress. It said if you get down on your knees and you seek God and you pray, then he will have passion and he will have mercy on us. The power of God is waiting to make a comeback. We want to make it a political issue. But what does the Bible say? I'm glad you asked. Let me share it. He said, in the last day, the prophet said, speaking for God, in the last day, I, there, well, well, first of all, Jesus said, in the last day. See, he's shutting me down. He's shutting me down right here. I don't care. In the last day, <laughs> there will be wars. And rumors of wars. There will be famines and disease. If you watch Fox or CNN or MSNBC or PBS or whatever other letters make a news station, you can understand that there are wars and rumors of wars. There are disease. There is all this stuff going on. How can you say revelation is not important? We're living in these days. It should be scary to a point. We are called to be the difference makers. If you're getting baptized, you can go get yourself changed. Let me stop and say that. If you're getting baptized and you need to change, now's the time. If you don't need to change, then sit right where you are, which apparently both of you are just going to sit there, okay? It continues and goes like this. There's something else that God said through the prophet about the last days. 
Yes, it's bad. Yes, it's terrible. Yes, there's struggle. Yes, there's sickness. Yes, there's disease. But then he said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I pray that God would pour out his spirit. Let me give you the the, the last thing and then we're going to shut it down. No, it's not the last thing either. I lied to you. What's new? I mean, I always tell you we're closing and we're not. The passing. There will be a season of death. They died in the street and they were left there. What does that mean? Is there really going to be dead bodies in the street? There's dead bodies in the street now. But you can turn the channel. There's dead bodies in the street now. But you can turn the radio off. There will be bodies laying in the street of the two witnesses. The church is dying because the witnesses are not standing up. Two witnesses for an entire world. That's where this book has us. Two witnesses to proclaim God's word. Two witnesses. There's more than two witnesses just in this church. There's more than two churches just in this city. And there's more than two cities in this country. Think about only two left to proclaim the word. And people died in the street. The Bible says they were tormenting them. You know what they were doing? Sharing God's truth. They are killing the church. Those two people represent the church. They represent you and me. Not just this church, the church. And the the, the, the evil that's in the world is killing the church. The beast that comes out of the sea, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit. If you're sitting in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, on the street corner looking for a big beast to come out of the sky, it's already here. We're looking at it. It can't be all that scary if it's the world you already live in. What do we do? We have to have a passing. There has to be a passing from yesterday's church to today's church. Yesterday's church was great. It worked so much. It put Yesterday's church put people like me in perspective, people who are younger, who can carry the church. There has to be a passing. There has to be a passing. What do you mean a passing? Come here, JJ. If I'd have thought about this sooner, I would have had a picture for y'all. This is JJ. Say what up, man. What's up? Not to me, to them. What's up? Okay. This is JJ. Jay Diesel, as he's known by his fans. He's a YouTuber. I have the, I have the honor of calling him my, my baby boy, my youngest child. When, when, when we were in Fort Wayne the first time, JJ was born here. And I would come up and... And, and for those, like, I know Jerry knows and Megan and Tim know, and I don't, I don't know that Josh ever seen it, but, but we, would, we would go to church every Sunday because that's what we do. And at the end of the sermon, whether I was preaching or whether the other pastor was preaching, J.J. would come up and he would get the microphone when he was about this tall, and he would hold it with both his hands, and he would put it right to his mouth, and he would just go, boo, 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 boo. Do it. Show, show the people. No, you're not doing it good. And he would just, he would just, he would go at it. He would be like, bah, 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 and he couldn't even, not even saying any words, just, just preaching to preach, just hold both hands on the thing, just, bah, 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 bah. and now Jaden is nine, I think, right? How old are you, nine? Yeah, he's nine. And when we started this church almost three years ago, we was at a, a, a unit down the way. And Jaden talks much better. You can go sit down now, handsome. Thank you. He talks much better, and he got up one day, and he was, he, it wasn't like he, he got up and he had the microphone. We were at church doing something, and the mics were on and everything, and he grabbed one, and he started preaching again. But this time he was using real words. And he didn't go to like the everybody knows the God so loved the world that he didn't open his Bible at all. Out of his knowledge, he went to 1 Samuel and he started talking about King Saul. 
And he said, how many people know who King Saul is? How many people are super familiar with King Saul that you could tell me about it? Okay, a couple of you. JJ said, King Saul didn't look like, or he looked like a king, but he had a bad heart. And he was running around the whole thing, and he was just saying, King Saul. And then, and then there's another Saul that you should know about, and he changed his name to Paul. And then he had the kids up there, and he started praying for him, and he was like, he was like, all right, Elijah. Boom! And he started praying. He was like, King Saul, come out! He didn't really do that, but... <laughs> What is the point of that? That's a new generation. There has to be a passing where I can say it's your turn. I can say it's your turn. Yesterday we were talking, Jeremy and, and, and Pastor Josh said, we were talking, I don't remember what we were talking about, next year at Thanksgiving or something. And I said, who's going who's gonna to take over? And Pastor Josh said, I'm believing on faith that Jeremy's going to be ready to preach by next Thanksgiving. It's a passing. Just because you're older than me. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> you are, but I just wanted everybody else to know that. All right, all right, all right. I got one more. I'll, I'll give it to you, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's the prompting. After the season of death, God's life, God's breath will breathe back into this church. And I believe that that's where we are right now. I believe that there has been a, a season of spiritual death in this world and that God is looking at the witnesses in the churches and breathing life back in and saying, wake up. And I believe that there's a fresh awakening happening. Now I'm going to close with this. This is my real close. Get ready. Get your mind right. Over and over again, thousands of surveys suggest this. People who identify themselves as Christians, Bible-believing, maybe even carry their Bible to church, Christians. Every week they're in church. Only around 98% of them, of us, only uh, about 98% of us do not tell anyone about Jesus. 98%. That means only 2% of Christians who say they love God, who say they read their Bible, who say they know the, the, the uh, Great Commission, go and teach, go and preach. Nobody's telling nobody nothing. I already gave you the words, Jesus loves you. Now I'm going to give you one more stat, and I'm going to ask Pastor Stephanie and Pastor John if they want to come up, and we're going to get ready for this baptism. You guys can sit up here and chill. The Gospels record that Jesus had around 132 moments of contact with people. Not 132 people, but 132 moments of contact with people. I'm going to break those down to you. Six of those moments of contact were in temples. Six of them were in temples. Four of them were in synagogues. So 10 out of 132 were in places of worship. 122 moments of contact with Jesus and people was in everyday mainstream life. Jesus spent most of his life outside of church talking to the people. Those are the people that Christ was most interested in. Those are the people that Christians most ignore. The message is simple. To be like Christ is to be a witness. To be a witness is to share the warning. Jesus is real. Jesus is returning. Jesus is waiting. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your wisdom and your word to spread through your people. I pray, God, that you would have your hand over each and every one of us and that you would speak to us and reveal your word to our hearts.